Okay, welcome, welcome, welcome uh, to the PAID Summit uh, 2023. And this is our first uh, panel. Uh, we're super excited to kick it off uh, today. Uh, this is a new format for us. Last year we were in person. Uh, this year we are virtual uh, every Tuesday and Thursday for 90 minutes for the month of October. Uh, and uh, as you'll see today, we have an incredible group of speakers and panelists. Um, so we're excited to start the conversation. Uh, my name is Arlene Lemus. I am the CEO uh, for Pave Prevention, which stands for Proactive Anti-Violence Education. Uh, and um, as I said before, super excited about kicking off this summit. So I'll share with you a recent headline of an article uh, that I read um, just the other day. And it said the article topic, uh, title was Toxic Workplace Leaves Employees Sick, Scared, and Looking for an Exit. I'll also share with you that the MIT, University MIT Sloan Management Review found that a toxic work culture is 10.4 times more likely to contribute to attrition. We know that last year, the Surgeon General released a framework to create safer and healthier workspaces. And number one, number one of the recommendations was minimize physical hazards, discrimination, bullying, harassment, and all forms of violence. I think everyone on this panel and everyone who is joining us today understands what the definition of violence in the workplace is, but I'm gonna share it with you as OSHA has it listed. As it has it listed. Workplace violence is an act or threat of physical harassment, intimidation, or other threatening disruptive behaviors that occurs at the work site. It ranges from threats and verbal abuse to physical assaults and even homicide. So as we recognize it from microaggression through physical event and even violence against oneself. And I'll share a staggering statistic or within the healthcare se sector statistic that I'd like that just was released on the 26th of September. And that following 1.84 million people between 2008 and 2019, so let's think about this. This is pre-COVID or post-COVID era. This survey and this research concluded that the risk of suicide was higher for healthcare workers compared to non-healthcare workers, specifically registered nurse, healthcare support workers, and health techs. So we know the problem is clear. The issues are clear. Violence is impacting all of us, but today we're here to discuss the healthcare sector in particular. So thank you again for joining us. We have some incredible, incredible panelists and so that we get every minute with them, their bios will be shared with you in the chat. So please, they are accomplished. They are dedicated to creating a better world, uh, a better healthcare sector, uh, uh, and better space for all of us. So I will move forward. Again, please read their bios uh, and, and acknowledge their accomplishments. So today our panels are our panelists are Mr. Eugene Raginsky, Michelle De, De Stefano, and Dr. Leonard Freeman. So what I would like to do is I would allow each of our panelists to please just share a little bit of your story. Uh, and how you find yourself, even if you find yourself in the violence prevention conversation. Because uh, I know that I've pulled some of you in to this conversation, uh, but I'd like to know how you view yourself and how you see yourself in this conversation. So Eugene, could you start us off and just share a little bit about yourself? Uh, and, and again, how do you find yourself in this violence prevention uh, conversation? Absolutely. And Arlene, thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. It's, it's a pleasure meeting all of you. I met you, uh, some of you guys a little bit earlier. Um, so it's really an honor. 
Um, well, my name is Eugene Roginski. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I've done a lot of stuff in behavioral health, uh, started out uh, in um, working for various outpatient centers and counseling, got into the private sector in 1999. And in the process, I also worked inpatient psych, intensive outpatient programs as well. Um, I also um, started doing uh, business development for healthcare companies, which included continuing education, uh, for healthcare uh, providers, and particularly nurses, clinical social workers, and licensed nursing home administrators. And um, so in the process of doing this work, I decided to subspecialize and uh, specialize in anxiety and psychological trauma. Um, and I was invited to speak in different, uh, in different locations. So while speaking, people would come up to me and say, Eugene, can you um, basically talk to our staff and explore different issues that are happening in our departments? What I was surprised is... Um, is how many issues involved violence at the workplace. And this was mm -hmm. uh, this was among healthcare professionals, mental health professionals. Um, looking into the subject a little bit further, I became a little bit passionate about stress and how it leads to burnout and different uh, external and internal factors that lead to burnout in healthcare professionals. Uh, they are a little bit different. I also started looking into a little bit more about uh, other types of burnout that could happen that can compound healthcare uh, stress. So if somebody, for example, is having burnout or stress in a relationship or uh, caregiver, uh, caregiver stress and burnout, which we call compassion fatigue, while at the same time facing certain uh, situations at the workplace that are causing burnout, um, that individual can, and as I've seen, <clears throat> would act out in different kinds of uh, verbal, uh, verbal violence or utilizing the physical violence. So that was, uh, that was very interesting to me. And since then, I have started doing work and uh, doing more um, research and uh, lecturing on, uh, on prevention, how to spot and mitigate and intervene in these types of situations before burnout escalates. Great, thank you, Eugene. Um, I will also share with the group, for those who don't know, I'm a lifelong martial artist and so is Eugene. So thank okay. you, Eugene, for joining us. Thank you, um, accomplished. Right. Michelle, please share Again, if you even feel yourself in this conversation in violence prevention, where do you see that intersectionality for yourself? And share a little bit about what you're doing and about yourself. Sure, thank you, Arlene. I'm very excited and honored to be here um, partnering with Arlene and the rest of the panel. Um, and so um, a little bit about myself. Um, I am the CEO and founder of Sore Career Coaching for Healthcare Executives. And um, I've had over 30 plus years of progressive leadership experience from bedside to boardroom, a chief nursing officer to beyond as a business consultant and as a healthcare um, consultant. And I, um, I launched SOAR Career Coaching um, because what I'm doing in my company is actually creating resilience for the nurse leaders, teaching them skill mastery um, and also helping them to um, look at if there's a need for career pivots, career advancement. But in that um, section that I'm in with working with um, healthcare leaders that are from healthcare organizations right now and, and, and still working inside these organizations, what has become extremely apparent is that um, due to um, the COVID pandemic really um, started exemplifying some of the things that were happening with burnout, understaffing, which really escalated. But what we know with this understaffing, it has and can lead to, um, to workplace violence because there is um, bullying that occurs, more attrition occurs because of the stress. And also what we're finding is that um, leaders are also held to very high standards, which they should be. But the leaders now are being led in sort of a toxic environment as well. So if they don't meet a metric, they're being threatened to lose their positions. So our vital leaders right now that are helping our staff become resilient and to really work, work through, you know, how do I re um, receive and get feedback? How do I handle the stress in the most professional way? You know, what's emotional intelligence mean? Okay. Um, they're now um, kind of feeling the, the pinch as well. And it's been very disruptive. So um, my work and how I see this happening um, is that I really want to create leaders that um, can really understand and how to still take care of themselves, but to manage and empower staff so that we can um, really break the cycle. And also creative ideas of staff retention, creative ideas of recruitment, 
um, being at the forefront so that they are top game in what they're doing for the current organizations. Or if they decide that this organization isn't the right fit, that they're gonna wow their next organization with this skill set. So I'm very passionate about um, working with all of you on this and, and, and looking at these great innovative solutions to decreasing the workplace violence, particularly due from understaffing and burnout in the nursing workforce. Mm. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you for that. Um, and my dear friend, Dr. Len Friedman, please, uh, I know this is a, a, not the place you saw yourself in, is in the violence prevention conversation. But please share how do you where do you see that intersectionality and uh, and and what, what you're up to these days, please. Very good, thank you, Arlene. It is a pleasure and a delight to, to be here today, and I am truly honored to be part of this really remarkable panel and to be with all of you uh, this morning, regardless of what time zone you happen to be in. Um, as Arlene <laughs> mentioned, my name is Len Friedman. I am my day job. I am a professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management in the Milken Institute School of Public Health at the George Washington University, which I am required to say under contract in one breath. Um, okay, cue the laughter. But <laughs> I've been in healthcare in one way, shape, or form uh, since I was 15 years old, uh, originally doing volunteer work at the, the Cedars-Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. My, my current role, uh, I teach a number of different courses, uh, organization, behavior, and uh, human resource management in healthcare, leadership and ethics in healthcare. I teach our capstone course, uh, and I direct the executive master of health administration degree uh, here at GW. What all of that really translates to is that I'm in the pipeline business. Uh, the students who graduate from our program, uh, we think, and I hope, have the competencies to be able to move into entry-level management and leadership uh, types of positions at health sector organizations uh, across the country and honestly around the world. My interest in, in this whole domain has really been around the uh, the realization that every community, at least in the United States, if not uh, outside of our borders, has got a big blue sign with a big white H on it. And that piece of symbolism has traditionally been a place where people can go for help. They can go uh, to escape from the from issues that are are affecting them. They are sites of shelter and of compassion. Uh, when bad things happen in our respective communities, this is where people go. So whether it is in a natural or um, a human-made disaster or you know, a, you know, a pandemic, or it really matters not. So our assumption has been that hospitals and healthcare deliveries uh, systems have been um, places of safety. And we are finding more and more that that is not the case, that the sort of violent behaviors that are occurring in our society at large have diffused into our organizational lives, whether it is walking from the parking lot into the building or you're you have uh, someone who's been admitted into your emergency department, and what follows is uh, our group of people who uh, have uh, bad intent in their mind, or uh, providers acting badly towards one another. I think there is a real tangible connection between the violence that occurs in the healthcare workplace and the 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 level of burnout and uh, the number of, or of persons who are leaving our organizations. Although I'm not quite sure that the grass is always greener outside of, of our buildings. So with that in mind, I'm going to stop and uh, turn it over to Arlene and I'm looking forward to this 
larger panel discussion and hearing from all of you in our breakout rooms. Great. Thank you, Dr. Lin. Uh, it was a powerful story when I, when I was speaking to your class, uh, you, you interjected that story with me and your feelings on this. And it really has continued to shape a lot of my thought uh, around the healthcare sector. And it, uh, it really is so many places, not only within the healthcare sector, but so many places that historically have been safe spaces for us, schools, libraries, hospitals, all of these places are uh, unfortunately uh, no longer able to be called safe spaces anymore. So what do we, what do, we, this is the purpose of our summit. Yes, to have these conversations via sector, but to also acknowledge the intersectionality and also tear down the silos that we're working in to create overall safer spaces. Um, so thank you, uh, Dr. Len, uh, for putting that in my mind. And, and, and I share that story quite often, your thoughts on that. Um, and Arlene, before we go on, Arlene is a uh, a yearly guest in the Capstone course that I teach in our MHA program and has traditionally been one of our top uh, rated guest speakers. And I am so grateful for Arlene and uh, her taking the time and share her thoughts and uh, her experience with our students. Mm, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Len. I mean, I appreciate the opportunity to just put a little bit of a seed in the future leaders of the healthcare sector um, to think about, hey, this is definitely not only impacting your bottom line, which we know it is, uh, but it also is impacting the morale of your staff uh, and really um, the level of treatment that your patients are receiving is at risk to... Um, deteriorate. So I'm, I'm grateful for those conversations. Uh, so Eugene, I'm going to come to you with a question. So I know that you are counseling and supporting within the healthcare sector uh, and beyond. Um, could you please share any experiences with us where um, either it was shared with you or you experienced it, violence having an impact and derailing someone's potential um, at future success? You're muted, my friend. I'm so sorry. Oh, um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, a couple of years ago, I was um, actually approached after giving a presentation to a parenting group by uh, a healthcare provider who ran a small healthcare agency. And um, she basically explained that uh, there was a lot of hostility, a lot of hostility um, to within her employees, and she wasn't quite sure what was going on um, until one of the employees physically lunged across her desk and try to strangle another employee. And um, that, of course, is um, frowned upon. So um, digging a little bit deeper, you know, um, so she asked me if I can meet with some of her, uh, some of her employees and take some surveys, see what's the overall level of happiness? What are people, what, what is she doing wrong um, as, a, as an administrator? Basically what ended up happening is um, the, the, the situation was not as complex as I initially thought. Um, what wound up happening is that um, that particular employee has been frustrated with uh, a being being overworked. Uh, she also had some personal issues as far as development, as far as how far does she believe she is along in her own field, based on where she is at now. So this was a, also a developmental issue. There was also a lack of transparency uh, within that uh, within that organization. And part of the lack of transparency was this: Why are some employees permitted to work from home, and why are some employees hmm. required to come to the office? Simple question. And actually, when um, when we got to the core of this transparency issue, it, 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 there wasn't there was an explanation. You know, there was an explanation why some people had to come to the office and some people were allowed to work from home. Uh, so all this build up, build up, build up. And at the same time, um, now you know, at, at the same this this individual was also experiencing a lot of problems at home. Uh, some of her frustrations at work led to uh, feelings of burnout. She was questioning her own professionalism. She was questioning her own effectiveness with her patients. Um, and in that stress, she was also, you know, when, when people hit burnout, usually it trickles down to other areas of life. Um, she was also becoming frustrated in her own relationships. And uh, especially, so one of the big uh, factors was that she was also taking care of an uh, elderly parent with Alzheimer's. So you had that caregiver fatigue as well. So 
all that led up to a moment where she, uh, this individual was um, asked a very simple question. Uh, at that moment, um, she could not answer the question and she felt judged. And mm -hmm. um, instead of, so, you know, uh, she did own up and uh, to, uh, as to, you know, as to her behaviors. Uh, but at that moment, she felt like the person she was trying to answer was not giving her the uh, was not giving her the ability to answer. The person just turned away, and that kind of a talk to the hand gesture uh, caused this kind of an explosion. So, mm -hmm. um, so this was a so in as as a this was the first time I've seen something like this happen. I've seen people, I've seen toxic personalities in healthcare as in any other uh, corporation, but this was the first time I've actually seen this spill over into like a, like a physical action. Mm -hmm. um, but since then, I have seen similar situations over and over and over, and uh, most of them could have been prevented with transparency, with checking in with staff and how they're doing, checking their happiness scale, checking to see what's going on with them, what's going on in their lives, and how can we do a better job So, um, with, yeah. uh, with supporting you. So. Hmm. Yeah, so you've touched on a couple of things there, Eugene. Um, so the, the healthcare and hospitality sectors are uniquely, and I don't say in a good way, uh, uniquely positioned that almost all the forms of violence that OSHA describes and um, categorizes. So uh, employee to employee, um, customer to employee, external uh, impact from outside of the workplace into the workplace. Uh, yeah, it, it is, it is right for almost every, it is right for every category that OSHA, OSHA designates. Um, and, and another thing I wanted to add to your uh, story that you shared with us is one of the, it is, it seems very simple, but one of the things I believe most powerful about the PAVE training is that we just ask the simple question of what's going on here? Like, what's going on here? Why am I so adrenalized from this situation? What is happening? Is it truly what's happening right now? Is it something that I brought from home? Um, is it something that is activated in me uh, that I need to step back and acknowledge? What is going on here? I, I think if we could just take, just, just give that skill to every single person, so many things would be uh, averted or paused or uh, diffused. So thank you for sharing that, uh, Eugene. Yeah. So Michelle, you and I have had several discussions about how um, the issue of violence in the workplace and burnout and toxic culture within the healthcare sector can be approached or should be approached. Um, and uh, I believe strongly uh, that the individual needs to be empowered with a certain uh, skill set to maneuver violence and toxicity in their workplace. But I also believe that to have true cultural shift, you have to engage leadership. Uh, and so I know that we've had several discussions on this. If you could please share what you're working on in this area. And also let's touch upon the discussion you and I have had about the usage of assessments and how we spend millions of dollars on assessments every year uh, and, and there's no follow through mm -hmm. or there's no real work done from the information we gather in assessments. Please, sure. Michelle. Sure, thank you, Arlene. So um, my number one importance for me in, into addressing this decreased burnout, it, it does start with leadership as, as our leading, Arlene is talking about here. And it really is developing this heightened awareness and zero tolerance for whether what's happening on the units, whether there's increased burnout, whether there is um, a cultural degradation that's occurring. Um, and also um, having zero tolerance policies for any type of retaliation and or bullying between um, healthcare providers. And I wanna tell a story because this really impacted me as a chief nursing officer, and then we'll, we'll get into some what these surveys are. And I'll weave the, the um, about how to assess what's happening on your units and your organization. Um, but I had, um, as a chief nursing officer, had a 75 bed high acute acuity um, behavioral health unit. And this was one of the one of the units was actually a lockdown. So that's how severe the patients were. They were suicidal risk um, and everything else on a lot of um, stringent medica medication. We were promoting um, a healthy and safe work environment for the patients as well as for the staff, obviously because of this high acuity in this behavioral health unit. And um, this in involved myself, my VP of nursing, rounding on this unit. They they knew who we were. 
We did feel that we were developing rapport, that they could come and talk to us about anything. Um, I spent many hours rounding, um, asking for feedback and questions. Um, and we did know the morale was also um, not the greatest where we wanted it to be on this unit. They always felt like the stepchild to the rest of the organization, like medical surgical, okay? That tends to happen a lot in, in these different types of service lines. However, as we were rolling out our um, safety awareness, patient safety awareness, what had occurred is that I got um, the inevitable, well, not the inevitable call, but a call that really devastated me, that a patient on our unit um, actually um, committed suicide on our watch. And this was on the day shift. And we had implemented Q15 minute checks with um, monitoring of that, with documentation of that. Um, we talked about the essence of this. We talked about how to deescalate if things happened in these Q15 minute checks, but this was really to keep the staff as well as the patient safe. Um, we pulled the documentation immediately. I ran to the unit when I got the call with my quality director and my CEO. And the documentation, the record showed that there was Q15 minute vital signs checked. Um, and so that I felt that the documentation was appropriate at the time and that everyone had done um, what they would have done in their licensure and practice protocols. Um, however, I, I decided to think one, one thing through. So I did ask to see a video on the unit um, because this was a lockdown unit and there was cameras so that we could keep you know, each other safe with security. And what I found that those Q15 minute checks had not been checked and it was actually falsification of the record. Now, when I saw this as a chief nursing officer, my heart bled. I got uh, choked up and I'm um, trying to get through this, this story. It happened many years ago, uh, right now, okay, as well. It's how much this impacted me. Because what we were doing as leaders obviously wasn't working or something wasn't working. What this did to the rest of the staff, of course, this individual was removed. Um, this was actually a felony case. Um, but what this did to the rest of the staff was cause more culture degradation and a feeling of helplessness on the unit. And one great nurse in particular was not um, was not coping very well, obviously, with what had happened with a peer because she was on that shift. And she felt that she was totally responsible, that she should have seen that, that the, this, mm -hmm. this was not occurring. What we did for this individual, we allowed her to talk. We allowed her to express her concerns. We allowed her to cry. We allowed her to get angry. I brought in the EAP for her, but we did allow her because her request was to not be on this really high acuity behavioral health unit and take a break for six months. And so we put her into another unit. Um, we also talked to the staff and continued our, our, our um, you know, crusade for what was happening here. We had an employee engagement survey that um, when we got our results uh, initially, you know, the results weren't that great. But as we worked through this particular incident and they saw that the leadership um, listened to the staff, looked at the survey and said, what do you mean when you say um, this, it's not safe here? What do you mean when you feel you can't trust your employees? Talk to me about what this means. We worked on an action plan with our staff. Our staff created the act created the action plan with senior leaders, myself included. And they came up with what we had to do and the top three things that we had to change. And so we implemented those tactics, but we didn't stop there. We didn't put the survey in our computers and never look at it again. We resurveyed them quarterly. Were these actions the right actions? And the simple, the second you know, quarterly surveys were, did it get better? Did these actions get better? Did it get worse or did it stay the same? And if it got worse or stayed the same, we were back with, you know, meetings and talking with staff. What else can we do? What are we doing? So it's one thing to have employee engagement surveys. Many of our organizations, particularly in healthcare, are very much data driven to the point of nauseam. But if you're not looking at the data and if you're not empowering your staff to come up with the solutions with you and you as the senior leaders listening and letting the staff know you're there for them. The story of this nurse that we did give a break to came back after six months. She became the best and the brightest nurse in that department, and she was promoted to the charge nurse. So this is what it takes. Um, very sad story, but I'll tell you, um, going through these types of hard challenges times, this is where our learnings happen. But it really is know your unit, assess it and then figure out together how you're gonna correct this. Our employee engagement surveys after this incident went up twofold in less mm. than a year. Mm. Great, 
Michelle, I'm going to ask you, you prompted a couple questions for me. One, mm -hmm. uh, again, discussing, you know, de-siloing this information. Um, you tie right into another one of our topics later on in the month, which is moral imagination. Uh, I mean, you used your moral imagination to address this horrible thing that happened. Uh, and and uh, I have a question for you, and maybe some one of the other panelists can answer it as well. What does losing a nurse cost? Well, losing one nurse, depending on specialty, um, one RN turnover a year is anywhere from 40000 to 100000 a year. Right. One so, nurse in an organization. Right. So you, you allowed this nurse six months off, and you made out. You made out like a bandit because this nurse became one of your rock stars yes. um, when you chose your leadership chose to handle this a certain way. You used your moral imagination to answer a tough, tough question and to make yes. some 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 difficult decisions. So this is the out of box thinking. It's it's simple, but it's not easy. <laughs> Uh, so these are the type of uh, things we, we are recommending. We have to look at these issues from a different lens. We are not ever mm -hmm. saying that extra lights in the parking lot and panic buzzers on the doors are not important. All of the, those things are super important, but we ha it's still not doing enough. We have to create a, a, a different approach uh, to creating a better culture in the workplace. And Arlene, I do want to add one other thing too. So talking about my moral um, obligation, my moral creativity, um, that it wasn't easy for me because I was actually asked by corporate leaders, you know, above me, you know, you think it's lonely at the top and it's even lonely, I guess, in corporate, but as a chief nursing officer, I was actually asked in a big meeting with, uh, I say, God in his country around observing me. Would I bring at that time, um, after this instant, would I bring my family member to be a patient on that unit. And um, I kept my moral creativity and also my transparency. And very professionally, I said, no, I would not at this time. Um, that did not um, get me a lot of brownie points, but it was something that I had to state because um, they knew I was going to be there for the long haul. And I was going to assist my team, my staff, get to the next level at any cost. So that's that leadership that sometimes, you know, you may not have that you, that you're not giving the answer that they want to hear, but I had to give the right answer so that we could make these changes. And I had the support from my CEO and everyone else um, above me. Right. Right. Great. Thank you for sharing that story. So I'll add on to the assessments. Uh, I love the way you um, add the importance of assessment and it has to be something that's ongoing. I think you shared with me in one of our conversations that it was almost at your weekly meetings and your monthly meetings that you were looking back at the assessment and saying, Hey, what's going on here? You know, I, you made it very simple. Are things getting better? Are they getting worse? Or are they staying the same? And then uh, you moved from there. So as part of our assessment, our employee experience survey that, that PAVE uses, uh, I am one of the categories that really amazes me when I see um, uh, the results is this area called dehumanization and how people feel dehumanized in work. Um, it's it, It's been the eye opener for me. When I first saw that category brought into the into the uh, the survey, I thought, hmm, I wonder what we're going to get here. And it, it really is quite powerful that people don't feel supported, don't feel respected. Um, they feel micromanaged. Uh, so it's, they feel for all practical purposes, death by 10,000 paper cuts, um, you know, constantly kind of picked at and demoralized. Uh, so it, it is something we need to start talking about uh, to create a, a better and safer and healthier culture. Uh, and another category that continues to ring for me when I see these responses is, did they feel they could report and did they feel supported when they reported? Um, those two categories also, uh, the the responses are, are always quite eye-opening for me. Um, so I'm going to come back to Dr. Len now. So Dr. Len, when when you're, you're shaping the young, pliable minds uh, of future leadership, in the healthcare sector. Um, has this become 
part of the curriculum for you and uh, no judgment here. I'm just asking, um, ha what are the discussions around creating a healthier and thus a more productive workforce within that healthcare sector under your leadership? What are you suggesting to them? Sure. Um, so, you know, great question. And all I can do is answer <clears throat> on behalf of the work that we're doing here at the George Washington University. Mm -hmm. And this is not meant to uh, be generalized across the uh, all of our uh, other, both undergraduate and graduate programs, accredited or non-accredited. We had a fundamental change in our curriculum uh, about 10 years ago that sought to really refocus the, the emphasis of uh, the preparation of our students. They come out really very, very well skilled in the areas of finance and information technology and strategy and economics and all of these really critical skill sets that, that a young leader is going to need if, if they're going to be effective. And I will own this bias, and that is healthcare and healthcare leadership is fundamentally a relationship-based business. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we can we can teach you to look at a, a profit and loss statement or an income statement or balance sheet, or we can have you assess whether one uh, EHR is better than another. But if we're going to really do our jobs right, it's to help our students understand about the human moment in healthcare. And that coming out of an MHA program like ours, that they have to be able to effectively have really good conversations with people across their organization, with, with their nursing staff, with their physicians, with all of the other clinical uh, members of, of the enterprise, along with their patients, their families, payers, providers, regulators, their, their, the community uh, in which they live, the press that, uh, that covers them. What we've really tried to do is to humanize the preparation of our students. And I, I know this term is thrown around somewhat cavalierly, is that a word? Uh, but the, the term soft skills, which every time I hear that, my hair wants to catch fire. And you'll notice that's really gray right now. It's That's just in reference to the, uh, to the, every time I hear, oh, well, soft skills are nice. And that reminds me of the little teddy bear that I had when I was young and growing up. I consider these absolutely vital core leadership skills. Mm. If our graduates are going to be effective in whatever part of the health sector they choose to enter, they absolutely must be able to relate effectively to the people both inside and outside their organization. So things like emotional intelligence uh, are is something that we emphasize. The as a matter of fact, yesterday in class, we spent an entire day learning how to listen to one another uh, and communication skills with listening being at the at the hub of these things. So we've taken a number of very concrete steps that are hard to measure. Uh, I'm not quite sure that I can tell you how effective our students are in these, these sorts of interpersonal skills until they get out and do their fellowships and even better, get hired um, for a full-time position. But, at least, but we're being intentional about it and mm -hmm. helping them appre understand and appreciate the just the centrality of the, of the, of the human moment in healthcare. Now, granted, it's it's part of a longer journey, and I realize that this this may sound like a bunch of academic doublespeak, 
but they're hearing it and appreciating it mm -hmm. in a context where they can begin to test out some of these ideas and learn how to do the right thing before they get out and uh, and into a job. Mm. Great, thank you, Dr. Lin. And it's clear uh, when I when I engage with your students uh, with your classes um, that you are having an impact on them, and it is on their radar. And that's all we can ask right now is that we at least put these conversations uh, on their radar. Um, one of the things that really struck me as a conversation I had with one of your students after. Uh, and I had made a point during my presentation to not only think about, I wanted them to think about not only what was happening within the hospital or within the facility, but what an employee might be bringing in to the facility. So, so there has to be some engagement with employees about what their life is like outside of work so that they can be the best that they can be at work. Uh, and uh, the the example I gave was someone who is suffering through a domestic violence situation at home cannot come into work if they are if they do not have a true sense of belonging at work so that they can share with someone what's happening to them, then they cannot be the, the best nurse, tech, support person, physician that they can be at work. And then and now we have to start thinking about, service to the patient suffering because they cannot present themselves uh, to their highest potential. Um, and uh, they, your student came to me after and, and said half jokingly, but serious as well, this, this is going to keep me up at night. <laughs> uh, like uh, are my employees coming in, not able to hit on all cylinders and how do I create that culture? And I said, that's, your job is to create a culture where people feel like they can come in and belong, have a sense of belonging enough to say, hey, this is what's happening with me. Uh, and in order for me to perform at, at my best, I may need to step back today and pick up slack somewhere else and not be hands-on with patients today. You need to create that type of atmosphere. Yeah, Would you Arlene, like to contribute? Yes, go for it, Dr. I'm sorry, I just want to mention two quick things. The first is that the very first little video they watch in my HR and OB class is produced by the Cleveland Clinic. And the idea of this video is, as you said, you see all of these people in your organization and each one of them has a story to tell. And some, you need to take the time to listen and to understand and to hear what other people are saying. The other thing I would just add is something I read earlier this morning. It was a little piece out of Becker's and talks about elbow time. And I've not been familiar with elbow time. And the idea is basically you and the other person just put your elbow on the table and you're attending to and listening to what that other person mm -hmm. has to say. So it really drives home the point that you just made, Arlene, that we need to be very purposeful about hearing the stories of our staff, mm -hmm. regardless of where they are in the organization. Well, if, if you're running a large facility with several thousand people, that may not be possible. But what about your frontline leaders? Right. What about those who are in line management who have a number of direct reports? I think it's incumbent that we attend to not only others, but also to ourselves. We are not immune in leadership positions from the sort of stresses that, uh, that you mentioned. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Lynn. And it reminds me, before I pass it to Michelle, because I'm sure she wants to say something on these topics, but um, it reminds me of just how much sport we can learn from being in sports. <laughs> uh, so as a coach, right, as a coach, it was incumbent on me to just in a very non-threatening way, fist bump or high five or whatever with each of my athletes when they entered the mat every day for training. How's it going? How are you feeling today? One to 10, where are you at? I'm a seven, I'm a six, my hamstrings are tight. 
it you have to create that culture where people can communicate with you how they are feeling. So now I, as a coach, can know that I, that athlete is going to give me a seven today, and that's their 10. And I've got to be okay with that as leadership, and I have to adjust my training accordingly. So I, I think it's just these, again, they're simple but not easy. It's a simple thing just to check in with the people that we work with and with the people who we, we may be leading on what's going on here. How you doing today? Simple but not easy. Michelle. And Dr. Freeman, I commend your work. Um, and I laugh at the softer side of life because it reminds me of you know, how when they used to advertise for Sears, um, Sears department stores, um, the softer side of life. Um, I used to laugh, like, what did that mean even in a clothing store? But um, but anyways, um, you know, the leaders really need to be taught to be engaging with their staff and getting to know their staff. And of course, we can't, um, the span of control, particularly in nursing, you could have anywhere from 50 FTEs to 90 FTEs on your unit. So to get to know everyone that personally, but you know, one of the things that we we try to do is um, know know their family. Um, you know, know their um, know their children's names if they're if they were out ill and they had a sick child or something. Ask how they're doing when they come back, but really get to um, listen, um, round on your staff, find out how things are going, um, be present and be there for them. Um, but I also want to um, share that um, something that's coming out of the University of Maryland and the School of Nursing that's been out for several years is the R three program which is very similar, um, Dr. Friedman, to what you're talking about, but they're taking nursing students and it's called the Resilience uh, Retention. Um, and they have modules now that are going to be um, given to any of us who wanna use those. And I am planning on using those in my, in my leadership development, but it's the same thing that you're talking about. They're doing an academic partnership with the um, faculty of the schools of nursing, with the students, as well as those that are helping those new nurses, graduate nurses enter into practice. And they're teaching skills such as um, giving and receiving feedback, their emotional intelligence, okay, um, how to manage up, um, how to um, de-stress and their obligation, you know, to take care of themselves. And so there's been a lot of studies, this um, work that they're actually measuring that seeing the impact of this. So this is um, from um, Dr. Cinder Rushton, and I know I'm gonna be bringing her um, on a live LinkedIn audio event with me to discuss this concept, because this really is where we have to start at the um, entry level, whether it's entry level into leadership, entry level into um, the workforce, so that we're more cognizant now and more aware, more aware of the types of behaviors that are gonna give us wins as opposed to creating more toxicity in the workplace. Um, so I commend your work and it would, I'd, I'd love to get the two of you together. So it's, um, it's very great work. Great. Thank you, Michelle. So we're just about time to set off into our, our breakout rooms so we can have some intimate discussions with, uh, with the panelists. Uh, Eugene, did you want to add anything before we separate, before we move to those breakout rooms in the conversations that that's been had? I just a quick note, I really like Dr. Len's words, Dr. Freeman's words when you said a human uh, moment in healthcare. Uh, that really resonated. As a matter of fact, uh, I worked in different places before. I, I just noticed that one of my uh, mentors is actually in the room, one of the happiest places I've ever worked in. And um, and one of the reasons was very simple. It's um, It was safe. And um, and uh, management was able to ask employees, you know, is there any other place you feel safe? Do you feel safe at home? How are you doing? And um, and they did get to know people on that more human level. And when somebody was having a hard time, there was the question of like, why now? What's happening? You know, talk to me. So there was that uh, ability for employees to feel vulnerable and not be judged and not be dismissed and be heard. So yeah, I, you know, thank you so much. Hmm. Thank you, Eugene. And before we separate, I'll just, again, uh, I'm going to uh, pull it back to a comment that uh, uh, a fellow Olympian shared with me, Nancy Hogshead Monker. Uh, on one of our podcasts, uh, someone asked her, you know, this concerns me so much. I want, I've benefited from sport. I want my children to do sport. How do I, uh, how do I find and pick or identify a healthy culture for my kids to do sport? And Nancy uh, uh, put it so simply, she said, ask for an injury report. If kids are getting injured constantly at that facility, 
it means they can't speak up. They can't say that something's hurting them. They can't say that they're overworked or they're tired uh, or the weight cut is not safe, whatever the sport be, but check the injury report. Uh, so it, it, it's it's those those little things because we cannot speak up. Communication is so important um, to creating a healthier and safer work culture. Um, well, so this has been great. We will we will circle back before we say goodbye as a group uh, after the breakout sessions. So in these breakout sessions, if you could please just think about sharing um, when protocols and procedures have worked for you or when they haven't. Uh, within your sector. And I know that uh, many of you are not within the healthcare sector. So this is great. We want to hear from you. Uh, again, we're trying to de-silo this information. So when pro protocols and procedures have worked for you, or they haven't, um, and if you have not reported, why? Why did you not report? Uh, and then anything else you'd like to share. But if you could think of those two kind of topics uh, within your breakout rooms, that would be great. So I'll see you soon. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, well, I have a good example for this for um, a previous um, job where I was at. Uh, I was with the United Nations. I was working in Pakistan and I had like a case of harassment from a driver that I'd reported to, um, you know, our well, back then was the deputy of the organization because we had like kind of, you know, a more friendly relationship just to get advice on how to um, work around this issue and get it addressed. And then, um, you know, he actually had to follow all the procedures through HR and everyone um, actually took, you know, all the steps necessary to put in place all the rules and regulations that were like necessary to address the issue. Um, I think it was... Uh, kind of easier and faster the process because I hold a lot of more privileges in that situation. I was a white person. I was a younger person. I was a woman. So they were, you know, and the driver was like an older man, was a local man. Like there were a lot of like, you know, privileges from my side that help kind of make the process faster and also get like a, a positive resolution for me. But it's been one of the few cases also talking with colleagues that has been uh, successfully like addressed and resolved. And then after that actually came out that a lot of other uh, local women had reported internally in the organization, but nothing was done before. So like holding on those privileges of being like international or being like, you know, a white woman from Europe and all of that helped actually without knowing it at that time, because I didn't know, uh, solve the issues that a lot of other women couldn't solve before. Um, so there was actually a good, um, you know, um, solution of the case. HR did all their work, uh, all the levels of the organizations were informed from local to regional to international. So, um, yeah, that's a good story. Mm. Thank you, Federica. And thank you for reminding us that, you know, sometimes protocols and procedures don't work for everyone, even yeah. though they have the best intention and they're laid out properly. Uh, privilege doesn't come into play. Uh, it, it, is, it comes up in conversations around the question, why didn't they call the police? Because mm -hmm. some people don't have the luxury or feel comfortable of uh, calling police. Uh, so uh, thank you. Thank you for bringing that and, and reminding us of that. Would anyone else like to share um, when protocols worked? Uh, my friend Clara, please share with us. So great to see you. Thank you, you too. This is actually a, when protocols don't work. <laughs> Do you want me to hold on to that? <laughs> yeah, please. No, please okay. share it. Um, you know, I'm I'm located in the northeast of the United States in New England, and we've had a huge increase in neo-Nazi activity in um, in our state and in our region. And so, and we have a number of uh, people who work in our hospital setting who are recent immigrants uh, from Africa. And so they are feeling very uh, understandably and really targeted um, and very unsafe. And yet um, there's a reluctance on the part of their workplace to provide programming for them to assist them th with this because the targeting is not always happening in the workplace. It is a community safety issue. 
Um, and so we've been struggling. I think we're making headway, but to get them to realize that, of course, this is a workplace safety issue as well, and it impacts them coming and going from work and all of those pieces. So, yeah, thank you. I personally have not seen uh, protocols um, and procedures not work, but I have heard um, situations in which in uh, certain areas, especially of healthcare, uh, the tendency to report is um, is highly unlikely. Uh, I've also heard uh, situations where uh, healthcare professionals um, at a certain level do feel um, do feel very uncomfortable discussing behavioral health, discussing their mental health, discussing feelings of being burned out or overwhelmed, even discussing inappropriate interactions with uh, superiors. Um, there, there is a fear. As a matter of fact, um, some of my clients who come in are people who believe that uh, they're worried about um, some kind of repercussions if they do uh, discuss being overloaded, overworked, or not getting enough uh, clinical support. I've never seen it actually happen, but I have seen people who felt this way, um, and you know, and uh, so they so they seek out uh, therapy services. Um, S S Silver Lining Behavioral Health is a program I run. Um, a lot of our a lot of the people who come to see us are people who are nurses or uh, healthcare specialists, um, mental health specialists, therapists, psychologists, uh, even medical doctors. And uh, though the protocols are there to um, to support them and to help them, and maybe they maybe they're perfectly fine, and maybe they would work. There's still that fear of being vulnerable. There's this fear of disclosing. There's this fear of um, addressing um, addressing issues of I'm overwhelmed. You know, I need some help. So those words are very hard to say, especially people who are in the helping professions. Oh. Larry, I'm so sorry I missed that. I got booted out uh, trying to let somebody in. It, someone else in it sent me to a, a different room. Uh, so sorry about that. Um, Laura, please share. Um, I also wrote about it, uh, about not having protocols. But then um, I remembered about the ones we had in Bosnia. I'm working in the field of journalism and it was the extreme case. So uh, um, we had meetings where we were instructed to uh, take every time to take different route to work because there was actually danger of having killed because this organization worked with crime and corruption and organized crime. So uh, they were like extreme measurements and we had big meeting uh, yeah, we got uh, one person got killed again this year, um, uh, our source. So it was extreme case. It was extremely stressful. Um, and the, the, the measurements were extreme as well. So the mental health was an issue in this organization. Hmm. Thank you, Laura. Um, yes, Marilyn. Uh, so I was the director of a large outpatient office in a larger outpatient mental health um, social service agency. And I think that there's this fallacy that because we're mental health clinicians that we don't have to talk about this and that this topic is really not brought up enough or stressed, even in a social service agency that's providing the services that we ourselves should be aware of. And I think that gets lost sometimes. Uh, in the midst of staffing and everything else that the organization is doing and that the clients are receiving the service, but the staff also has to be given that same respect and options for being able to talk about their own mental health and what's going on with them in order so that they can provide the service that the agency is there to provide in the first place. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, yeah, I think we we... Again, I'll go back to my little thing here that it's simple, but it's not easy, right? We need to remind ourselves that, you know, we, we have to put our mask on first um, before we can put anyone else's mask on. Um, uh, so I, 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 uh, I appreciate you sharing that even in the most 
well-focused help organizations. Uh, we may be overlooking the people that are imparting those skills and helping others. So thank you for that, Marilyn. Um, so I shared with you in our main presentation that I am a little um, taken aback why many people answer our employee experience survey saying that, yes, this happened to me. I didn't report it. Um, and the two top reasons for not reporting is I didn't think it would do any good. And or um, it, it didn't rise to the level that I felt I needed to report it. So I think these there is this desensitized, we're being desensitized to feeling like, well, it's just part of the job. It's just part for the course. Uh, I'll have to get over it. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts around those two answers. Anyone? Well, uh, organizations have seen that um, do a good job with having staff um, be comfortable enough to report. They also do a lot of pretty good staff in services and education, and they give them permission almost uh, to talk to. And they, they even say, they, they even um, go uh, bullet point by bullet point saying, what is what do we want to hear? And nothing is too small. Uh, be open with us. Um, I do think that there's a certain pride, at least in healthcare that, um, or in mental health, that we should be able to kind of solve our own problems. Uh, and if there's some kind of a conflict at work, or if somebody is being inappropriate, or if we are afraid for our lives, um, that we should kind of handle it ourselves. And uh, I don't think that's correct. Um, the the locations, the the corporations I've seen who handle this beautifully are the ones who offer enough staff education. Um, you know, suggesting to them that 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 no situation is too small. We 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 want to hear everything and uh, trust us that we will handle this uh, appropriately, uh, whatever it is. Uh, I also feel that um, sometimes individuals believe that um, if they report some kind of distress, um, feeling burnout or stressed out, somehow their own level of professionalism will be judged. That they will get some kind of a poor review, whatever that means. That somehow they will be ineligible for rehire. Um, that somehow it's going to impact them and somehow news is going to trickle down to their patients. But I've never really seen that happen. I think uh, people do understand that um, healthcare providers can go through problems and, and they can have difficulties at home and they can be overwhelmed. Um, the few anecdotal situations I've heard where there was some kind of, uh, there, were, there were repercussions for somebody reporting this were usually um, in pretty toxic work environments. Um, where it was very clear that um, pro healthcare providers were just the worker bees, where um, where the census was most important, where um, just like Michelle described, um, providers were basically judged on output, on billing, on quantity instead of quality. So, um, yeah. So, so Eugene, what you're saying is even just the fear of retaliation, whether it's perceived or actual, is impacting whether they report? Well, absolutely. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, I, I've uh, So with uh, Silver Lining, I, I've had some clients who are physicians, and um, we're noticing certain behaviors, whether amongst the nurses or amongst other physicians or even the administration, um, they are pretty scared to say that um, they saw something or they heard something, and they're worried about several things. A, they're worried about losing privileges. They're losing. They're worried about um, not being able. So, if let's say it's a surgeon not getting the right uh, operating room hours, uh, they're worried about um, being um, not being heard, or being victimized, or um, or being just dismissed. You know, well, why can't right. you solve this situation? So um, yeah. sometimes they're worried that by their actions, they could be causing more problems. So, mm. it, so, so the tendency is to stay away. Yeah. So thank you for that. Laura, I'll come to you in a second. So I want to ask the group, so what would change that? What would we have to do in that setting to make it more comfortable for people to come forward? What would, what, what would need to change? Any thoughts? 
I think one thing is, is that managers or supervisors need to be trained in how to hear the kinds of reports that their staff are telling them about and how to help them understand what their role is and how to react, what they need to do with that information and reassuring their staff that it was a good thing that they reported, whatever it was. I think the middle management piece gets missed. I love the way you presented that, Marilyn, trained on how to hear and how to receive those. That That's that's great. Thank you. Um, anyone else like to share their thoughts on how we change that? How do we make it okay to come forward? Um, I, I, I don't think only training helps. Uh, I think every employee should know that it's okay to do that, mm. first of all, and there's a safe environment for that, really. And and um, they should uh, let it know to every employee, including newcomers, especially to newcomers. So the environment is safe, it's tolerated, not tolerated, it, it, it's encouraged to speak up when it's hard and when you feel and when you see uh, uh, that that uh, there will be burnout and the signs of burnout. Also, I think uh, there should be mental uh, mental health first aid givers in every uh, workplace. So they should recognize the signs of burnout a bit more early. I think it's really, really important. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and I think uh, along the lines of what you're sharing, uh, Laurie, is that there is a big, there is a large, huge disconnect between employees and leadership, uh, especially in the healthcare sector. Uh, so I'll share with you a story that I heard on a panel where this nurse was just at wit's end. Uh, and she just shared that, you know what, I don't want another coffee mug. I don't want another pizza party. I don't want another a uh, pad for my mouse. That's not appreciation to me. Appreciation to me is to have a conversation on how I'm feeling and what my needs are. I need a meditation room. I need some. I need a safe space within the hospital where I can decompress. This is what I need. If you want to show your appreciation to me, hear me on that. Don't throw me a pizza party or give me a coffee mug. I, Absolutely. I, just, I think. I was, oh, sorry. It was so like profound by me that the disconnect was so huge between leadership uh, and their nursing staff. Um, so uh, I think quick fixes are really popular. They think but that it, it solves everything. Yeah, let's mm. give a fruit plate to everybody and they will be happy because food makes them happy. No, it won't. In long run, it won't. No. So Marilyn, what would be different? Uh, what would change, in your opinion, what would change that disconnect? What would be needed to change that disconnect? Um, I think a combination of what's been said here before, particularly by Laura, that new staff need to be onboarded in a way that they can understand what the culture of the agency is and that it's okay and in fact encouraged, as she said, to report things that are going on that don't feel safe. Um, and the combination of training for middle management. Mm. So both of those things need to happen at the same time. They can't just right. have one without the other. So it, it, it always amazes me in sport, which is my background, we continue to have all these rules and regulations around keeping our athletes safer on and off the playing field. And the main rule... <laughs> One of the main rules is coaches shall not have sexual and intimate relationships with their athletes. It's a main what rule. Wrong? It's a main rule. Everybody knows it. But it continues to happen over and over and over again. So if these policies and procedures are there, what this is why I go to empowering the individual. Because I, as a coach, I cannot rely on people following the policies and procedures. So I have to rely on empowering the athlete, the young athlete in particular, to understand inappropriate coercion, to identify an inappropriate power dynamic, to be able to set a boundary. These are those things, those human safety skills, the soft skills uh, that, that uh, Dr. Uh, Len was speaking about. 
that I just, I keep continue to fall back on. This is what has to be imparted. And then maybe the policies and procedures will catch up when someone uses their voice. But if we're waiting on policies and procedures to keep us safe, I don't think it's working. And in my opinion, it's not working. I'd love your thoughts. Well, I think it's important to discuss what are the what should be the repercussions for uh, policy procedures not being followed. Um, you know, policy procedures are only as good as uh, their enforcement. Um, now, the situations where I found employees being less overwhelmed and um, and, and feeling more in control, uh, several things were present. Uh, first of all, employees in healthcare um, had more country had more options over their uh, profession. And it could be like, Eugene, today you're leading groups. Tomorrow you're taking uh, clients one-on-one. -on -one. Next day you can be doing a case. Next week you can be doing case managers. Having options over their day-to-day. -day. Controlled options, but still options. Also, when employees felt that they were um, that they were acknowledged for small successes. It doesn't have to be big, but acknowledged by management for small things that they've done, that they've done correctly. Little things mean a lot. And... Um, and, and the third is um, a situation where an employee uh, or a healthcare professional, any professional, I guess, um, could feel vulnerable enough and trust their uh, manager or superior enough to be vulnerable with and to disclose certain information, knowing that there's going to be confidentiality and they can talk about themselves. It's those three key things that can really make burnout a lot more manageable or preventable to some extent. Mm -hmm. um, but whenever I saw a lot of rules and regulations and uh, as you know, I'm sure, Aline, as everybody here knows, that some some corporations, some companies have manuals and manuals and manuals. So many rules that and regulations and protocols that it's even hard to contain them all. Um, but there's lack of enforcement, there's lack of oversight, and sometimes people are not even familiar with these rules and regulations because those are not even reviewed with the with the employees. So, anyone else's thoughts on that? Yes, Cassie. So it, the my last place I had an, uh, the ED came in and I had worked the, before with her before, but she wasn't the executive director and and she just started changing the culture. Um, we had discussions, um, open discussions um, about um, about talk, you know, about speaking up and modeled it at work. Um, policies and procedures are great, but if it's always been done this way, that's what, usually a thing. Well, it never happened. Nothing ever happens when it, you know, and that's, those are the systems. If you can openly talk about when the system is at play, when those, when patriarchy is at play, um, you know, when you're in a, a meeting with people and all of a sudden, you know, your coworkers, they're all male are talking over you that somebody mm -hmm. can openly say, Hey, we just been here for 10 minutes. She's tried to talk. And four of you have talked over her, right? We're openly stating that this is not, it's not safe for her to do this. And if she has a male boss, then how is she going to go complain about that, right? But making the culture, um, to talk about those things that we don't, because silence is what keeps these, these, these things at work. And to, for me, that's what it was, was to openly talk about and hear these systems called out in ways mm -hmm. that, you know, that you don't think of, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, it, and it can be kind, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to be a jerk about it, but I watched that and it was when people knew would come in, they would be surprised, like, oh, you said that word out loud, we don't really talk about that word. And, mm -hmm. um, and it's like, and then we would all say, no, we talk about it and we make changes. So it sounds like bystander intervention. You have support when someone is talked over that bystander stood up and intervened and supported you. So yes, yeah, strengthening bystander intervention on every level, I think is super important to changing culture. It, it allows people to feel heard and feel supported yep. both at the same time. Um, so hmm. thank you for that, Cassie. Yeah. We are almost up for time. Is there anything else anyone would like to share before we go back to our our main room? Lori, your hand is up. Yes. Yeah. Um. Uh. I just wanted to let know about case when there is protocol, but example is like 
I personally was fired because uh, I was burned out. So it's hard to go and tell about it to your boss when you see what actually happens. It's the same mm. example what you told everybody at, at, about sports. It's happening, nothing to do. But what to do then? Like nobody can tell anybody about burnout. They will get mm. fired. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a that's a toxic culture where you can't speak up and you can't share your thoughts. Exactly, Laura. And, and I'll also share with you, it changes when your boss is the person who's harassing you or making your life uncomfortable. It also changes when it's the, you know, high value neurosurgeon or surgeon that is harassing people uh, within the healthcare sector workplace. Um, all those things are you know, they're difficult things to get around and creating a culture so that even, um, you, you know, the tech who's interacting with that high value surgeon, uh, high va you know, has a voice. That's the biggest thing is giving all stakeholders a voice in the process uh, and empower them to use that voice if something bad is happening. So, wow, these this this has been great. I hope that you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. Uh, and we will uh, head back to the uh, main room. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hello, good to see you. Oh, good to see you. Thanks for joining. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining. Hi, Louise. Hi, hi Deb. Melody. Good to see your faces. Okay. Let's see who else is joining. A couple more. All right. So our topics. Um, I guess we can start with uh, when protocols and procedures worked for you. Um, Len, do you want to you want to hit that ball first? I'm I'm probably going to swing and miss on this <laughs> simply because you know policies and procedures are great until they're not. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm I'm reminded of the quote from uh, I think it was Mike Tyson. Uh, he was talking about his career in boxing. He said, plans are great until you get punched in the nose. And it's, I am not suggesting we not have policies and procedures. Uh, the Joint Commission would literally turn handsprings if we didn't. But my concern is that sometimes that locks us into doing certain things in certain ways and when the environment all of a sudden flips, then we're kind of at a loss. So, and I think instead we need to think about what are those couple of things that we want to make sure that we do really well all the time. And again, it's not to say that you shouldn't have policies and procedures, but be prepared to... Uh, to think of of alternatives, think outside the box when uh, when the environment uh, calls for that sort of thinking. Like I, I agree. said, this, I'm I'm a pointy headed academic. I can say those things because I've never really been in the business. So there you go. Take that for whatever it's worth. No, I I think it's I think you hit it on the head. I think um, you know I come from a school of you know plan the work and work the plan. And I feel like policies and procedures are really important infrastructure guidelines for us to, to kind of keep us cats corralled and make sure that we're hitting on all the important cylinders. To your point, though, there needs to be some sort of flexibility because we're always going to encounter situations that may not be in our policies and procedures or may warrant something that's a little bit different and unique. But we kind of brought this up in our last summit where one of the missing links be besides accountability and leadership was the following of, or the enforcement of policies and procedures where, you know, if someone does report something, 
it has to go all the way through without it just dropping the ball. Because then you have an employee who doesn't believe in your system, who doesn't feel heard or taken care of, and then you're going to lose them. And that, in a sense, is going to cost you more money. It's going to cost you more money either way, whether you lose them in turnover or you lose them because there's a suit, because something actually happened and it got worse. And then now there's a claim. So I I, I kind of agree. Um, Michelle, what, what are your thoughts? Well, um, I'm I'm smiling here at Dr. Freeman again because I give you a thumbs up for that. Um, I used to always go around saying, and, and I actually lived as a chief nursing officer in inside these buildings, right? Um, I I I couldn't possibly remember every policy and procedure, although there are clinical protocols and things that we really do have to adhere to um, because you know you're it's it's did did you follow what you had to and, and those those are a little bit different. But I used to always say that the best laid plans were on paper. Um, but what I focused on more um, was the culture change. And, and with that, um, so I, I lived by a policy and procedure that was this. Um, many years ago, we rolled out in, in, in several of the organizations I was in, Just Culture. And this was actually algorithms that if there was something that deleteriously happened to a patient or something that happened to you know, a family member or, or some, you know, something happened that we went through the right steps. Um, and that, that was followed and we were trained, leaders were trained, staff were trained on what this looked like, where, um, you went through the steps and it was punitive culture, um, of finding out what actually happened. Okay. And as, and we unveiled this very transparently. Okay. Um, so for example, um, decreasing urinary tract infections in the hospital, we try to keep our patients safe. They should not develop infections in the hospital, but sometimes they do. But we would review, you know, the protocols of, of the washing uh -huh. of the Foley catheter, those kind of things. Um, if we found that there was a, 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 a dip or maybe there was an aseptic technique that wasn't done, it was re-education, it was um, reinstating what had to happen, okay? And so this fostered communication that is very transparent okay um other things um that you monitor when you say about about lack of reporting um when i did not receive incident reports incident reports in a hospital setting are when something could have been um, a malfunction of equipment it could have been giving the wrong medication at the wrong time maybe a wrong dose but when i started seeing those incident reports not show up in my inbox like a lot of them that told me that the culture, the staff felt unsafe to report, okay? So it's a balance between this transparency. It's a balance between, yes, we have to have um, some procedures in place. You know, we have to have, you know, how do we evacuate if there's, you know, a fire, or if there is a, a shooting, we have to have these things in place. But then how are we reevaluating what has happened? How do we do an after event synopsis, okay? And once again, um, proponent on bringing the staff in at all times to talk about whatever went south and how we can correct that. So, um, you know, these are some of the things that as a leader, um, you just seem to work it because um, we can be bogged down um, with so many technical procedures and policies, but the real intent is at my end of my day, did this, could the staff report, did the staff understand what was expected and was I creating with my team a just culture that we could be transparent about what was happening in organizations and on our units? Well said, well said. Um, does anybody else wanna contribute their thoughts to policies and protocols? I, I would like to uh, just contribute something that comes to mind for me just from my area right now um, in speaking to maybe not the policies as much with procedures because I'm, I'm not sure of the written policy. Like I, I work currently, I'm a LCSW, but I currently work with American Airlines as a flight attendant. And we just in the past uh, week experienced uh, the death of a flight attendant who was discovered in her hotel room uh, on a layover about two hour, uh, two days after she was supposed to report for her flight. Um, so it's been in the media a lot because there's still a lot of information that's not known. However, in the entire industry and th among all the flight attendants on all of our social media and everywhere else, it's just sent uh, waves of ripple effects of 
what is our policy, right? What is our procedure? Because everyone does things a little differently as far as uh, your crew keeping one another safe uh, when one goes to a layover. And there are certain things in place, the way we check in, the who has access to that information, which is very limited. And what we're supposed to do when we leave uh, a layover hotel to ensure everyone is together. That does not always happen. And oftentimes it is the crew themselves that take it upon themselves to look out for one another. Um, and in this particular circumstance, there wasn't administration uh, involved in the way that apparently the policy is supposed to be. So this person went two days unfound. And it's not uncommon for people to get lost in the system <laughs> when you have irregular operations from weather and other things that crews have reported being somewhere for days, days at a time without crew scheduling, finding them or being able to get them where they need to be. So I think it just fits into this piece a little bit because it's a, a procedure that, that everyone is now saying, what is our procedure really? Because we've implemented our own in order to keep ourselves safe on a day-to-day -day basis, but because administration isn't really being clear or isn't trusted to follow through when they need to, to keep us safe. Understood. Um, has the airline made any sort of course correction with filling in this gap? Have they formally announced anything to flight attendants about, you know, adherence and implementation of the procedure or anything just to make, you know, staff feel safe? Like, okay, do, is it upon me? Is it incumbent upon me to check on the pilot, to check on so-and-so? in my crew or is admin going to know where I am? <laughs> right. Well, it, they, they, on paper, they know there's, they know where everyone is for sure. But it's interesting that uh, all of the communication that has gone out throughout the system has been more about, well, the kind of the thoughts and prayers aspect where we're going to yeah. keep this person's family and our thoughts and prayers right now. And EAP available to that crew and other people who knew this flight attendant and from that base, um, but not so much about the solution other than suggesting, suggesting that you do share your personal cell phone and contact information when you get to a layover, you know, do a group chat with everyone on your crew so that you can look out for one another. Again, putting it on the responsibility of the crew, uh, but other crew members have been making suggestions to the company about utilizing certain uh, technology that we have that we use for work and how to implement that and utilize that to kind of help us connect with one another instead of using our, our own personal avenues. Um, so yeah, it's still relatively new, but there I'm, I'm saddened at the lack of uh, communication that's coming out to really alleviate a lot of the concerns and fears that people have under this tragic circumstance. Wow. Um, does anybody else have anything to contribute? Any experiences that you've had um, with policies and procedures, whether followed, not followed, ideas? Linda? Yes, hello. I come from the Czech Republic, which is a country that's very inventive about not following procedures. You know, <laughs> like 40 years of communism, you have to live uh, with the system and actually learn how to um, sort of, um, I mean, even um, undermine the system from within. So uh, during the totalitarian regime, and in not following the rules was actually um, seen as, um, as a victorious um, anti-regime um, opposition. Right now, I bring self-defense and empowerment self-defense to corporations. And every class, I start, of course, with rules and regulations. And especially, for example, to HR people, I tell them, listen, this is for us. What else would you like to add? And how often are we using these policies we already have that people understand it, people like it, and they see it's for their safety? It's for their benefit. And how often they see it, uh, just okay, give me the paper, I'll sign it. Where should I sign it? Oh, do I have to read it? Oh, it's too long. 
so like total mindset shift with like this is for you for your benefit and you can influence it say something in one better one suggest another one and so on right. so that was that was very eye opening for me yeah, that's that's pretty powerful stuff. I think, you know, that kind of points back to what Michelle was saying in the opening presentation about having your staff included as stakeholders in the conversation so they are co-creating the outcome that they benefit from. I think that's really powerful. It's a it's a really big shift, right? Because instead of it being done to us, we're actually doing it for us. Does anybody else have any questions or anything they want to contribute to? And thanks to all the panelists, it was very great and insightful. I learned a lot. Thank you. Uh, I have um I have a comment, particularly on on Deb's story. Um, you know, because airlines and hospitals and education systems, the, the bureaucracy is very thick. Okay. Yet safety, safety is number one concern because a lot of the things that can happen um but you know in this in the spirit of employee empowerment um not sure how your structure would be but um i would really encourage some of you that feel this um about what has occurred to actually go to your immediate supervisor or find out what you'd like to put in place um that would be at least okay because no i don't you know we don't have to know why this person died or anything like that but um, what we would do to make sure that we're checking on each other, that we would all um, show up at the, you know, at the hotel lobby at X and that we're going to do a head count, you know, that kind of thing, so that it would be not this, um, I mean, it's still going to be, if, if a death does occur and someone's not around, um, it would you would get to the, you know, reason sooner and, and, and try to help that individual maybe if you can. But I would highly suggest going up the chain, see what can happen if you feel so badly. If it not receptive then the the culture is something that does need shifted but um use your voice um and it tends to be that administration and administration you know i used to be called administration um but there's a lot of people in there that want to do the right thing something something such as a, a trying to figure out what to do and how to heal those in these individuals and co-workers because of a death and a traumatic death that that no one expected right something that was just out of nowhere um, they probably are trying to figure out messaging and, and they might not even have the answers themselves right now, unless there truly is something documented. But I would say, um, go for it and encourage to speak up and come up with a solution because um, I do think that the right leaders will embrace that if that's, if that's your culture and your organization. Nice. Uh, does anybody else have anything they wanna contribute? I'd like to speak from a patient's point of view. I know that, you know, when you go to the hospital, there are structural procedures that the staff are supposed to follow. And if those structural procedures are inadequate, everybody suffers, the staff, the patient. I, I'm thinking of a particular experience when I was getting a PET scan. So I showed up really early in the morning with no coffee and no breakfast and was very grumpy. And I had to stand in line for 45 minutes to check in. And then I went and checked in and the woman who was checking in was me and was complaining because someone else should have been checking me in and she was checking me in and yada, yada, yada. And I'm like, hmm, that's too bad. I'm so sorry. And then I went and waited in the little room and the man who was going to give me the PET scan came in and he was really angry because I was late um, because the radioactive thing that he had to inject was going to, you know, it had a time limit. And so he was really rude to me and off we went. And I was like, dude, you're not being very pleasant. He like was, <laughs> he was like, <laughs> and, you know, it, it's like, well, this is obviously an administrative problem because if you don't put enough staff on, if you, if you set up X number of appointments in the morning, but you don't have enough staff to check those people in, then everybody suffers. It's just such an interesting problem and, and that is it it felt like a violent assault to me i knew it wasn't personal um but as a patient that's really you know you have to really advocate for yourself and it, it's it's kind of scary like when i um had a lung resection last year i was utterly helpless utterly helpless and if the staff 
wasn't going to care for me. There was, you know, I was coughed. There was nothing I could do. I had tubes coming out of me. So, you know, it's really, I, I'm really glad to hear um, the panelists talking about creating a good culture in these environments because a person who is completely helpless needs the nurses and the and the that needs everyone on that floor to be feeling well so that so you don't die so any rate that i that's all i wanted to say but i'm so pleased to hear that there are people who are actually uh trying to address this thank you for sharing thank you for sharing so much um i think the only other thing that you know we can maybe talk about is have you ever reported? And if you haven't, why did you not report on a situation? Um, I'll start. For me, one of the reasons why I knew something was wrong, but there was a part of me where I thought that it was part of my job to take the gruff, to take the bad behavior, because it was the industry standard for what I was doing at the time. I was in corporate real estate, commercial real estate, and it was pretty much a male dominated field at the time. And there was just a lot of bad behavior. And I just kind of, you know, figured that was part of what it was like to be in the boys club. Um, it wasn't only until later that I realized that a lot of it was really unacceptable, really bad, and I shouldn't have tolerated it. Um, but there was also the other part of it is like, if I were to report it, what are they going to do about it? Because I'm kind of the odd gal out, right? At the time. Does anybody have any experiences they want to share with reporting? It's not a fun topic. Well, I'll just share. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. But Mandy, go ahead. Sure. So I've had uh, a couple major experiences on reporting and for me it generally was I wasn't the only person it was affecting and I also knew even if I couldn't leave the job or the sport it'd be worse having to stay in that environment and not say something and I was always like the first person but I also know, knew no matter what it would set a precedence there'd be like a paper trail but in all these uh, reportings, it never generally was resolved or ended well for me. And it's unfortunate. And I'm just hoping it gets better. But more people do need to be report reporting. So, Well, and I also think in your case, and in a lot of situations, those that are the first to report, the brave ones, do actually give this unspoken permission to other people to also come forward if they are suffering from the same type of, you know, abuse, neglect, violence, whatever it is, manipulation. So, but I with that being, with that being said, I'm shaking, still talking about it. People need to really understand that it is uncomfortable in your general and a lot of, and this is across the board, different jobs, high level, low level, like it's, there's not a lot of support. So it's yeah. tough. Yeah. Yes. Because you're disrupting, you're disrupting the group, you're disrupting the job, you're calling stuff out. It's not a very, it's not very popular in my experience. Yes. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. I'd like to, I'd like to say one thing on this. Um, and so, um, you know, at the end of the day, um, if you, if you don't feel safe reporting, I actually, um, and this is what I, 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 I teach my leaders, my clients that, you're not in the right environment. And, um, you know, sometimes you have to accept the fact that this is not the right culture for you. Um, but one of the things for reporting is if you are feeling uncomfortable, um, get an HR rep with you, um, get several people in the room that actually hear what you're saying. Don't make it be one-on-one -on -one, um, because then you have more documentation of it. And, um, you know, I, I, really say, say report. Um, I've actually had staff come to me report on some physician behaviors that was very um, disruptive on the unit. Um, you know, we listened, this was a physician that um, I didn't care whether he was a physician, physician, I didn't care how much money he brought into my organization. The bottom line was he was being extremely disruptive and we had enough documentation then and, en and enough staff um, that we actually addressed this and said, well, four staff just came here 
discussing this issue. But I had an HR rep with me, even as a chief nurse, as a leader, an executive leader, um, make sure it's documented. But um, at the end, if it doesn't go your way, it wasn't meant to. And this is where that resilience comes in and realize that there's only so much you can do, you know, as, as an individual. It's it's now not in your control. Um, but if you feel unsafe then after reporting and there's retaliation, there are steps. There are there are procedures and steps to um, get you that kind of assistance if you feel that you've been violated. There are those words again, policy and procedure. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, I think I want to check in because I think we only have 10 minutes to report out to the group. So let me see if I can. Don? Let me text him real quick. Yep. Let's see. I'm here, Jim. Oh, hi. I just wanted to check in about um, when we're, oh, when it we're heading like, back into the main report out. Yeah, it looks like we have about five minutes left. Um, I'll start working on getting that process going for us. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Um, there are a couple of people that have not been able to share yet. I wanted to see if there was anything that they wanted to share about their own experiences about the topics we've been talking about. Um, or if anybody wanted to dive in deeper um, about the things that have been said in our report out, I mean, in our breakout room. I'll, I'll share something. <laughs> Hi, um, hello, how are you? I'm um, good. So I, previous to my current role, I worked in an organization where we, um, we put mentors in front of uh, middle school and high school students and they taught music and each of these mentors you know we the hiring process um, was something that I was a part of creating and before you see someone in the job you can only get to know them so well and it turned out that I had put a mentor in a school that he just wasn't morally what I would want for my students. And it was difficult because on the job, he was doing okay. But outside of work, I was getting reports that this person was sexually harassing women and doing a whole bunch of stuff. And so I don't have an, I didn't have an HR department. I was basically it. And so I, didn't have a policy or procedure to lean back on to say like, I would like this person to leave because they're making people uncomfortable, but I don't know how. So I, I guess when it comes to policies and procedures, um, you can kind of never predict what you need them for until you need them. And um, so a lot of times you have to have, oh, it's, we're ending. You just have to have people who are comfortable operating in the gray, which I was willing to say, hey, this is a gray area, but I would like to fire this person and make sure that they're not um, negatively affecting my organization anymore. And it was really difficult to, uh, to do because I had to prove that I had grounds to do so, but I had no policy or procedure. So in, inevitably we ended up writing one um, after this experience, but that's to say that they should be flexible, amendable and free flowing um, just exactly. because you never really know what you need until you need it. Yes, um, much like a, an employee handbook, they're a living, breathing document that are yeah. constantly evolving with um, current situations. Thanks for sharing yeah. that. Um, I think we're going to be ending in a few seconds and being pushed out into the main room. Yes. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the main room. Welcome back. We've got a couple people filing back in. I hope you had a good experience in your breakout room. We could have gone another half hour or so, at least probably in the conversations. Um, so does anyone from uh, the uh, other breakout room share to report, uh, care to report with us kind of a little bit about your conversation? Jen? I can. Um, so it was really, it was really great because we heard from several different sectors um, 
that also contributed to the conversation about, you know, policies and procedures. Do they work for you? If not, what would you do differently? And a little bit about reporting. So some of the key takeaways that we found were culture change should really be the focus for support, supporting policies and procedures because policies and procedures can be very uh, rigid and they need to be a little bit more fluid to account for situations that don't necessarily fit in a box. Um, Re-education is also something that seems to be very important to policies and procedures. Um, we also found that policies and procedures, if described the right way, are not an instrument to use against employees, but are rather supportive tools to keep employees safe and to help them excel in their positions. Um, let's see, policies and procedures. They can also be used to, when reporting, they can be used to set a precedent and also create the foundation for you know, an issue that may be ongoing that can then eventually help to remedy the problem, i.e. an abusive leadership executive or something like that. Um, the other thing that I heard was that policies and procedures are critical to the hiring process and that having, having you know, your like a hiring checklist, which should include a background check, which should include, um, you know, really calling those references. Don't just ask for references and read them, but actually do call those references can help you mitigate some um, issues down the line because seeing somebody in interview mode and on paper is not the same as seeing them actually performing in the job. Mm. So those are kind of the key takeaways that I found from our group. Great. Thank you, Jen. There was some crossover. Um, so it definitely, uh, in our conversations, there was the idea of strengthening training. It was suggested that every new staff member uh, receives onboarding that encourages reporting and uh, highlights the support of reporting. Um, and then I, I just love the way um, that it was presented uh, um, from Marilyn that middle management is key to policies and procedures being implemented and enforced. Uh, and she really uh, expressed and framed it in a way, middle management needs to be trained on how to hear and receive the reports. So I thought that was just a really nice way of like, yeah, we need to prepare them for what they might be hearing and how to best support the people coming forward. So that was great. Um, it was also brought up that yes, uh, policies, procedures do come and impact, impact people differently based on privilege. And we need to be mindful of that, uh, that privilege does come into play on who can report and how they report and how accepted they are when they report. Uh, and that needs to be acknowledged. Um, it was also brought up that within the healthcare sector, uh, we need to walk the walk, right? Which means that we need to support the people that are supporting everyone else. We have to help them put their mask on first before they're putting anyone else's mask uh, on. Um, and um, that a way that we can strengthen, it came up that there is always a, there are reasons why people don't report, right? And one of those things could be fear of retaliation, or derailing something in their own uh, mobility within the organization. Um, so we need to create a safe environment for them to report, um, but that bystander intervention can be uh, a strength. If people are allowed to speak up and support people or call out behavior of someone else, else on behalf of uh, someone, uh, it could have a huge impact on people feeling comfortable on reporting or speaking up. Uh, so I, I think that uh, I covered everything uh, in here. I, I did point out myself personally uh, uh, um, that, you know, we have policies and procedures, uh, the background that I come from in sport, uh, and it's very clear. Everybody knows coaches sh shall not have intimate and sexual relationships with their athletes. Everybody knows that. 
It's written into every coaching manual and every ethics manual around sport, but it continues to happen over and over and over again. So for me, empowering that athlete so they can recognize that behavior is much more important, giving them the skill set. And then maybe policies and procedures will be enforced if we start empowering the individual. But, you know, that's just my soapbox and Pave's soapbox uh, about this human safety skills that are imparted to each individual. I would love to do it as uh, Laura pointed out in the onboarding of every new employee. Um, but so yes, policies and procedures are there. It's a struggle if they're not enforced. What is the answer if they're not enforced and they're not supported? So, wow, we have two minutes left. This has been incredible. This has been an awesome kickoff to the summit. Uh, I have to say, of course, thank you to everyone that came out to the event today and joined us and gave us 90 minutes of their day. Uh, and I'd like to say a very, very warm thank you, a heartfelt thank you to our panelists. Um, if we want to clap it up for Dr. Len, Michelle, and Eugene, this has been great. Um, there is a little questionnaire if you want to take a few minutes and answer to give us some feedback. I think Federica just posted a link in the um, in the uh, chat. Um, and uh, if there is not anything else, Jen, would you like to share? Yes. Um, for any of those that are in the healthcare sector, we do have continued education units available for this session. So please um, shoot me a chat and let me know if you'd like to receive the evaluation form. I'd be happy to send it to you. It's uh, one and, and a half CEUs for this session. Great, thank you, Jen. Thank you for the reminder there. Uh, thank you to Power of XYZ for all the support in putting this event together. Uh, we appreciate your support as always. Uh, if you enjoyed this, we hope to see you on Thursday or next Tuesday. Uh, we're going to have more fascinating conversations and interactive conversations like this through the month of October. Our next topic is connected to the healthcare sector. Again, it is from research to action, shaping the future uh, through innovation and medical science around violence prevention. And we have Dr. Mary Clyde Pierce, Dr. Edie Sussman, and Dr. de Blasio. Really fantastic conversation on Thursday. We hope to see you there uh, and, and join us. Again, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us.
Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the main room. Welcome back. We've got a couple people filing back in. I hope you had a good experience in your breakout room. We could have gone another half hour or so, at least, probably, in the conversations. Um, so does anyone from uh, the uh, other breakout room share to report, uh, care to report with us kind of a little bit about your conversation? Jen? I can. Um, so it was really it was really great because we heard from several different sectors um, that also contributed to the conversation about, you know, policies and procedures. Do they work for you? If not, what would you do differently? And a little bit about reporting. So mm -hmm. some of the key takeaways that we found were culture change should really be the focus for support, supporting policies and procedures because policies and procedures can be very uh, rigid and they need to be a little bit more fluid to account for situations that don't necessarily fit in a box. Um, Re-education is also something that seems to be very important to policies and procedures. Um, we also found that policies and procedures, if described the right way, are not an instrument to use against employees, but are rather supportive tools to keep employees safe and to help them excel in their positions. Um, let's see, policies and procedures. They can also be used to, when reporting, they can be used to set a precedent and also create the foundation for you know, an issue that may be ongoing that can then eventually help to remedy the problem, i.e. an abusive leadership executive or something like that. Um, the other thing that I heard was that policies and procedures are critical to the hiring process and that having, having you know, your like a hiring checklist, which should include a background check, which should include um, you know, really calling those references, don't just ask for references and read them, but actually do call those references can help you mitigate some um, issues down the line because seeing somebody in interview mode and on paper is not the same as seeing them actually performing in the job. Mm. So those are kind of the key takeaways that I found from our group. Great. Thank you, Jen. There was some crossover. Um, so it definitely, uh, in our conversations, there was the idea of strengthening training. It was suggested that every new staff member uh, receives onboarding that encourages reporting and uh, highlights the support of reporting. Um, and then I, I just love the way um, that it was presented uh, um, from Marilyn that middle management is key to policies and procedures being implemented and enforced. Uh, and she really uh, expressed and framed it in a way, middle management needs to be trained on how to hear and receive the reports. So I thought that was just a really nice way of like, yeah, we need to prepare them for what they might be hearing and how to best support the people coming forward. So that was great. Um, it was also brought up that yes, uh, policies, procedures do come and impact, impact people differently based on privilege. And we need to be mindful of that, uh, that privilege does come into play on who can report and how they report and how accepted they are when they report. Uh, and that needs to be acknowledged. Um, it was also brought up that within the healthcare sector, uh, we need to walk the walk, right? Which means that we need to support the people that are supporting everyone else. We have to help them put their mask on first before they're putting anyone else's mask uh, on. Um, and um, that a way that we can strengthen, it came up that there is always a, there are reasons why people don't report, right? And one of those things could be fear of retaliation, or derailing something in their own uh, mobility within the organization. Um, so we need to create a safe environment for them to report, um, but that bystander intervention can be uh, a strength 
if people are allowed to speak up and support people or call out behavior of someone else else on behalf of uh, someone, uh, it could uh, have a huge impact on people feeling comfortable on reporting or speaking up. Uh, so I, I think that uh, I covered everything uh, in here. I, I did point out myself personally uh, uh, um, that you know we have policies and procedures. Uh, the background that I come from is sport, uh, and it's very clear. Everybody knows coaches will, shall not have intimate and sexual relationships with their athletes. Everybody knows that. It's written into every coaching manual and every ethics manual around sport but it continues to happen over and over and over again. So for me, empowering that athlete so they can recognize that behavior is much more important, giving them the skill set, And then maybe policies and procedures will be enforced if we start empowering the individual. But you know, that's just my soapbox and Pave's soapbox uh, about this human safety skills that are imparted to each individual. I would love to do it as uh, Laura pointed out in the onboarding of every new employee. Um, but so yes, policies and procedures are there. It's a struggle if they are not enforced. What is the answer if they're not enforced and they're not supported? So, wow, we have two minutes left. This has been incredible. This has been an awesome kickoff to the summit. Uh, I have to say, of course, thank you to everyone that came out to the event today and joined us and gave us 90 minutes of their day. Uh, and I'd like to say a very, very warm thank you, a heartfelt thank you to our panelists. Um, if we wanna clap it up for Dr. Len, Michelle and Eugene, this has been great. Um, there is a little questionnaire if you wanna take a few minutes and answer to give us some feedback. I think Federica just posted a link in the, um, in the uh, chat. Um, and uh, if there is not anything else, Jen, would you like to share? Yes. Um, for any of those that are in the healthcare sector, we do have continued education units available for this session. So please um, shoot me a chat and let me know if you'd like to receive the evaluation form. I'd be happy to send it to you. It's uh, one of the half CEUs for this session. Right. Thank you, Jen. Thank you for the reminder there. Uh, thank you to Power of XYZ for all the support in putting this event together. Uh, we appreciate your support as always. Uh, if you enjoyed this, we hope to see you on Thursday or next Tuesday. Uh, we're going to have more fascinating conversations and interactive conversations like this through the month of October. Our next topic is connected to the healthcare sector again. It is from research to action, shaping the future. Uh, through innovation and medical science around violence prevention. And we have Dr. Mary Clyde Pierce, Dr. Edie Sussman, and Dr. de Blasio. Really fantastic conversation on Thursday. We hope to see you there uh, and, and join us. Again, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, everybody. Speakers, if you'd like to stay on, I'd love to chat with you after. Thank you. I'm going to give it just a minute to let people leave on their own. Before. Great. Thank you, Nikki. <laughs> ah, my, my heart is full, guys. My heart is full. This was awesome. Really good. I hope you're feeling the same way. Okay, it's just team, All right? Please, your feedback. Thank you so much. This was awesome, Dr. Land. How are you feeling? I'm I'm feeling terrific. It's, I've got uh, another meeting I need to head off to straight Understood. away, but this has just been a wonderful experience. Arlene, thank you for making this possible, and Michelle, I'd love to follow up with you and have a conversation with uh, with your colleague. And so feel free to uh, to reach out and we'll make that happen. Great, great, Dr. Len, head out to your meeting. We hope to right. see you on one of the other sessions. So thank you very much. And, and Arlene, you, I'll see you in Arlene, I'll see you in Chicago in March. Yes, definitely, definitely. All right. Okay, Bye now. bye-bye. Eugene, how are you feeling?
Oh, we have to unmute you. Sorry, I'm <laughs> I'm used to giving these presentations, and I'm the I'm the only one not muted. Mm. But I'm <laughs> navigating this thing. So, no, I, I thought it was a great presentation. Um, fascinating to hear, Michelle. I you know it's always a pleasure hearing you. If you don't mind, I know you linked up with me uh, through LinkedIn. Uh, I'd like to make some introductions for you as well, if possible. Um, and um, uh, and Arlene, you know, um, there are big healthcare conferences coming up for um, NASW, National Association of Social Workers. There's some for nurse case managers, these big conferences for care navigators uh, and patient care advocates. And they're always looking for similar topics. Maybe if I can make introductions, however it's appropriate. I don't know, do I introduce? Oh, great, please, please. I, I say it all the time. Put me in front of people. I would love to talk about this. I would love to talk about what PAVE is doing and, you know, and how we change it. So, yeah, I would love to co-present with you, Eugene, anywhere or anywhere you'd like to apply. I'll send email introductions and I'll CC Mandy and I'll CC whoever is appropriate. And Great. Take it from Thank me. you. Thank you. Michelle? Um, I thought it was excellent. Thanks. The, the questions, Arlene, that you, you gave us were very um, thoughtful, insightful. Um, and tugging, tugging into what Eugene is saying, um, you know, we had someone in, in our breakout session with Jen that was a, what talked about a patient experience. And I do think that's something that um, should be from the from the bird's eye view from the patient, because um, we we talk about uh, creating this you know, compass to help our staff and the safe environment of our staff and our leaders. But um, due to this stress, um, the staff can be sometimes not very caring to the patients yeah. and what yeah. their experience. Um, so I think that that might be something in the future um, and, and what we can really do about them. Are they feeling safe to report? Because a lot of times um, they don't because they feel that um, their loved one's gonna be treated worse in the hospital, or whatever, but you know what's really happening here? And um, um, I'd like to link us up with a um, individual that I actually helped. Uh, she was the spokesperson for her mother who did eventually die when I was a chief nursing officer, but she has such a, um, a passion for talking about her story and um, what she had to do to navigate and then eventually to make some changes for her mother. Her mother, you know, had arthritis, couldn't even move in bed and, you know, someone that was very needy, but um, that might be another angle too, because it's also patients yep. that are feeling, um, feeling this and, and it's, it's not okay to have that type of anger. Of course it comes back to how do we manage the staff to manage the patient, but yet, um, yeah. That would be something that probably um, needs to be explored more. Yeah, we had a very insightful and for me, scary presentation at the summit uh, last year from uh, Al Shore. Uh, it is Al, right? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Arthur, Arthur Shore, excuse me. Um, and he his presentation was really you. The nugget you left with is you always need an advocate. Yeah, you always need an advocate yeah. with you. Do not enter into any healthcare situation without an advocate. Right, um, but so, that's yeah, sad. Kind of scary. Right. Yeah, that is sad. So, okay, I'm gonna. I have a uh, hard stop too. So, thank you so right. much. I appreciate so please, it. Please, yeah, please connect. join us. Yeah, join us for another segment. We'd love to have you participating and hear your 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 view from the healthcare sector, even if it is a different uh, sector. So. Thank you so much. Okay, Michelle, thank, thank you, everyone. You. And you have a great day. Thank you, Michelle. Okay. Bye. Bye. Michelle. Thank you. Eugene, I have one person that needs a, um, a CEU evaluation form. Not so, a problem. Um, do you want me to send it? Should I send it to them? Uh, what's everyone? I, I can I can send it out. It's not a problem. Okay, let me get you can... their their email address. Let's see. Uh, let me make sure I still have it. Marilyn Siegel. Marilyn Siegel, yeah, okay. And I'll send it over. Um, she's actually a psychoanalyst um, here in Lake County. Oh, pretty so well you know her? her? Uh, yeah, I know pretty well. I actually trained on her in 1994, 1995. Okay, I'm going to put it in the chat just so you have it. Mm -hmm. All right. I'll send her a sort. Oh, wait, hold on. I just... Okay. All right. If for some reason it doesn't show up, let me know and I'll just, I'll. Uh... Not a problem. If it doesn't show up, I'll, I'll find her. Yeah, I got it. There it okay. is. All right, Eugene. Marilyn thank Siegel. you so much. We're thank you so much, guys. Bye, and I'll just stay on uh, with my team and uh, we'll, we'll after action a little bit. Thank you, Eugene, so much. Very good. Uh -huh. Take care. Thank you. Bye, Bye. Eugene. Nice, Eugene. Bye. nice meeting, guys. Bye-bye. 
Nicole is asking to join us. Yeah, I think that there's some time zone confusion, maybe. Mm. Great. What do you think, guys? I great. thought that was great. Oh, really well. Minimal hiccups, um, except for the Julie Arlie switcheroo. Which yeah, Julie came in late. <laughs> Julie came in late. I tried to get her in my room. It put me in the other room. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering. I, I'm like, I didn't see you switch. Like, was she not needed? The other computer. I know. It's Julie. <laughs> and I'm like, why is Arlene in room two? Moving around. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Fanny, ¿qué piensas? What do you think? I actually text uh, Jenna when we were talking. I was like, Arlene like got so much better public speaking and she's getting like better and better. So I was very happy because the conversation was just so, I mean, of course we are into it. And of course we are speaking, you know, our language and everything, but it was really nice to, you know, follow the conversation, the rhythm, the engagement. So all of that, um, I was happy because we had a constant 22, 23, like people there. So it was kind of, you know, to be the kickoff, the first and everything else, I think it was good. The other sessions will have more time for advertisement and all of that. Um, I I think we will need probably to find a little bit more um, questions to engage people in the breakout rooms yeah. and to also kind of like please people be on video because it makes so, like such a difference yeah. to you know, talk to people's faces during the, um, the call. Of course, there will be internet issues, whatever for some people, but, you know, it just makes everything um, easier if we can see them. Uh, but I liked it. I liked it. And I saw, you know, um, people that I was not expecting, like, you know, Clara or other like few people from the community that <laughs> kind of threw themselves back in uh, without having been kind of bombard with like invitations or they were like that means Good. a lot because it means you really they really want to know what's going on um yeah. and I was also happy about the new you know people like brand new so I think it was a very nice start so Good. okay Mandy um like in the very very beginning I don't know for me it was a little like quiet maybe some mm. like music or something it was kind of flat then it picked up I want to say Jen did amazing in the breakout rooms leading to break <laughs> nice. no hey, I was Jen. so I was so impressed I got the most out of hearing everybody discussing and participating in our breakout room so hats off to Jennifer oh thanks honey you were great and good. yeah but overall I thought it was amazing it was good but I'm more of a person that like I like to hear more back and forth and just people kind of talking right at me so we should have more in the more time in the breakout room or I think so and I also would have liked to even switch kind of the mm. breakout rooms but I don't know how that works but yeah I really enjoyed listening to people in our breakout room and Dr. Len was great as stressed as he was at the in-person oh. summit he's so fantastic he was so good yeah, yeah. Oh. he's charming Michelle too yeah Eugene too. I enjoy Eugene yeah. too. Mandy, yep. You fought for him and he was great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Because he, he's well, I mean, he's into it. You know what I mean? He wants to be here. Yeah. <laughs> <So>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hi, Luna. All right. Yeah. Jen my is on my keyboard. Oh, okay. The Dharma oh. <laughs> It is. Um I am super pumped about having no technical hiccups and no programming hiccups. That just, that, first of all, that was just such a nice surprise because, right. you know, there's always that kind of business that goes on. Um, I agree with Fede. I, I think I want more poignant questions For the in the breakout rooms to get I mean, I feel like these were very, like, soft questions, which is probably good to say. Just to kind of. Uh oh! Now, the technical. Oh, we got our we got our hiccup. Yeah. Uh -oh. Just spoke too soon. Who let the pirate in or the cowboy? <laughs> <laughs> Nicole, did we miss you? Did we miss you today? Uh, uh yeah. I'm in a I'm in a smart to get to get uh to get 
connection in. So. Okay. Well, hopefully we'll see you on Thursday or you can catch the recording. Um, it was a great kickoff. Great kickoff. Good. That's what I'm hearing in the conversation here. And I just, um, I'm really excited to hear that. Good. Jen, you broke up. If you want to share again, you kind of yeah. broke up. Oh yeah. Uh, what I was saying is, is that I agree with Fetty that we need more poignant questions in the breakout rooms to get, get some good intel that, that will benefit PAVE in what we want to do with our business and what sectors we can kind of address better. Um, but other than that, I, I felt like, you know, people wanted to contribute. They just needed, they just needed a little prompting, mm -hmm. but Linda contributed, Deb Meyer contributed, Louise contributed, Sarah Stevens contributed, um, Mandy mm -hmm. contributed. you're breaking up jen everybody was great everybody Good. had a story and one thing that i did miss that i should the important thing your health care team be healthy so that you feel safe and healthy as well because when you've got staff that's going at each other or constantly complaining or treating you like you're at the mechanic shop, like they're completely dehumanizing the entire healthcare experience. It's really difficult. Um, right. And that came up a couple of times. So I just wanted to circle back to that because I didn't, I didn't immediately say that in my report out for our breakout session. Yeah. But that was something that same, that, that same Maryland's response to us is that, you know, we're not caring for the people that are caring for others. We're where even though we know they're doing the work and they know how to self-care and they know all these things, it's not happening. And then we're not caring for them. Yeah, man. Um, an interesting question that came up in my head was like, what initially draws like health care workers to the field and what do they think they're actually doing? And then what really happens once they get in, you know, like what they deal with daily that kind of desensitizes them, you know, that, the, am I making any sense? Like long yeah. Yeah. the type yeah. of absolutely. That's where my brain went. And then Arlene, my only kind of disconnect with the session is in our breakout room. I was kind of just giving an overview of oh, I had experiences reporting and it didn't go well, yada yada. And the disconnect for me, what and I know she didn't mean to, but Michelle was like right away, well you know, you should just leave, you should just quit. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, it's like, yeah. I was a child or I'm yeah. a parent or most people. Not that, easy. Yeah. that was the only disconnect where I felt mm -hmm. kind of like, uh, but I just, yeah. I just left it. Mm -hmm. so. I think she was speaking as a whole, you know, I think she was kind of bringing it back to, if you're in the position to be able to leave like a job, you know, like at a place of employment, um, that you do, that you can, you're not in the right environment. It's kind of like it's, what I would tell my niece. Like but she circled back to me and said like, Hey, you know, you, sh you should have just left. Or if you mm -hmm. were not safe, you should have just, oh. and I, I listened, but internally, yeah. I, you know, understood. most people understood. put it. That yeah. was the only time I felt kind of like, that. okay. That's the idea of privilege in a sense as well that Fetty brought up in our, in our meeting is, yeah. you know, not everybody has that privilege. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I get Nikki and Don, would you care to uh, chime in at all? Or I know you're on a time constraint or what are your thoughts? I thought it was great. We yeah. had, like Jen said, minimal tech hiccups. Um, we did have, so the person, the screenshot that you sent me, there was someone registered as XXX was their name. Mm -hmm. and their email was a private email from Apple. So uh, I removed them from Whova. They re-registered. I, I removed them again and they re-registered. At the same time, Elisa was having trouble. I don't think it was the same person because when I talked to her a minute ago, she just didn't understand how to get to the link, whereas mm -hmm. this person was trying over and over. So yeah. um, we're just hyper vigilant on our end just to make sure we don't get any fun surprises. Thank you. Um, but that that was the only thing that even had me raise an eyebrow. So mm -hmm. otherwise everything went really, really well, really, really smoothly. And I hope that that continues to be the case. So that person had to have paid 
or are they using the free link? They could have gotten the code from the newsletter or from someone who had the newsletter and shared the code mm -hmm. with their network. But mm -hmm. so I, I messaged the person on Whova and said, you know, for the safety of our participants, please confirm your identity. Whatever you tell me will be completely confidential, but I have to make sure I have a safe space. Right. Um, and Perfect. they didn't respond. And then I emailed the same email and also no response. So at that point, you know. I just cut it off. Okay. Yeah. Do, Thank you for do doing we, that. Do we need a slide with Heather questions? What brought you to this event today? Uh, you know what I mean? Do we do it to put in the chat? Do we need that? I just tried to be Heather and ask like where you're from to just encourage something. But do we need those uh, uh, something in the beginning? How Ma uh, Mandy mentioned it was kind of quiet and weird. Um, do we need something? So I was just like music wise or something yeah we can just do whole music like just do some simple whole music yeah just oh the last time we had music it was weird that was <laughs> the quiet was weirder it was like flat okay well, i do I, like people telling us where they're from yeah jennifer oh. can sing uh, <laughs> oh, karaoke the, course, only too. dogs will hear it <laughs> Okay. All right, guys. Well, this was a great kickoff. If yeah. they just stay at this level, I will be happy for the month of October. So yeah. congratulations. Good job. Successful Good job. start. Yes. Yeah. And I look Success forward to seeing you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, PXYZ. Thank yeah. you. Um, please let me know, Fetty, if we start getting any responses to the post. We got three. Okay. So far. I, okay. Yeah, so far I can do, I mean, do you want to do screen sharing now or I can just uh wait and then create the leader report? Yeah, you can wait. I know you're up. excited, Fetty. You can wait. You're, you're pumped up. Pumped up. Okay. Uh, well, one last thing. Can we make sure that we tell our speakers for tomorrow that they contact the people that they've invited to make sure that they show up? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yes. There, there'll be reminders through Hoover, through their email to the speakers. Yeah. And it's, and as soon as you get your little our sizzle sizzle reel ready, Nikki, I will blast it and say you missed it today. <laughs> we had a blast uh, for ninety so, minutes. As huh? soon as I end this meeting, it should give me access to my recording, uh, which Michael will have immediately, and he'll he'll jump on editing that. We hope to have the fully edited recorded version up within twenty four hours. Okay, so I should have that reel even sooner. Okay, my mom's okay. response: I thought it was great. It held my interest. Speakers were great. I didn't go in the break break breakout session, but I loved it. Oh, thanks, Mom. I, I was happy to see her. So Arlene, one thirty, Lamont and Maria, two fifteen. The whole panel for hospitality. All right. Okay. Oh, and one quick thing. Um, so the um, I communicate with Paul Biondi, and you know he said that they're doing the board meeting now. You know okay. for Alameda County, it's a long meeting. He doesn't know where we are on the agenda, but he's going to report out and, you know, okay. give us the good news afterwards. So I told him, I said, I'm going to be sitting on my hands waiting. Not really. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll let Power of XYZ roll. I know they got things to do. We're going to, I'm going to get up and move a little. Uh, yeah. So. I got to eat job, guys. I'm super excited. Super happy. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yep. Bye. 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 Bye.